to Politically Speaking. I'm Elizabeth Benyon, Professor of Political Science and Founding Director of IU South Bend's American Democracy Project. Today we will discuss the Red for Ed movement in Indiana. Joining me in the studio is Dr. Paul Mishler, Associate Professor of Labor Studies at Indiana University, South Bend. Also joining us is Wayne Barker, Superintendent of Schools at School City of Mishawaka. Thank you for being here. Uh, Wayne, I want to start with you. What is the Red for Ed movement? Well, it was an initiative started by the Indiana State Teachers Association, uh, basically asking for three considerations uh, from legislators during this uh, current legislative session that we're now in. And the first one was to hold harmless the results of the, the new iLearn standardized test. Uh, also, to repeal the PGP externship uh, requirement for uh, teacher licensing renewal, and then finally uh, increased teacher compensation. When we think about hold harmless, that's some place where we have seen a change, uh, but what is that PGP internship? Well, for teachers, externship? yes, uh, for teachers to renew their teacher license, they need 90 hours of PGP, professional growth points, and they required in the last legislative session of 2019 that 15 of them would have to be in a career component uh, where they would do an externship, possibly in business manufacturing, something like that to uh, increase their awareness of career and technical education. Uh, there was a lot of pushback to that. Uh, that was obviously a new requirement. And uh, we're seeing that probably in this upcoming session, they're going to make that a May provision uh, so that teachers have the choice to do that or not. As of right now, it's still a requirement. Um, and for some teachers, that would certainly be applicable to possibly what they're doing. But for many teachers, uh, you know, if they're teaching kindergarten, uh, it would be a stretch to say that they, they need to spend 15 hours working in business to renew their teacher license. And I think that's where a lot of the pushback came that it, it really wasn't applicable to everyone. One of the things that legislators will say, Paul, is that we have a job skills gap in Indiana and the purpose of that externship and working with a business and figuring out what the job needs are is to make sure to close that gap, but you're not sure that that's the right way to look at it. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I think that that framework is totally wrong and based on a misreading of history. Um, during the period when, for example, I think that the American public education system and the need for skilled jobs was most in sync, which is somewhere between 1963 and, and, and 1970, schools were meant to be schools. They had a broad educational agenda. They were not vocational training except at the very end where we had technical and vocational training as an option for some high school students. So the question we need to ask is why do we think schools are the answer to this? And I think that's a very different agenda, which has to do with really an attack on education in general, an attack on the role of public schools and democracies. Remember, American public education, for all of its faults and all of its problems, which have been discussed endlessly by people like me and others, fundamentally, when it became a mass phenomenon at the beginning of the 20th century, its role was to produce democratic citizens. That's the job. It's not to produce steel workers or coal miners or business executives or railroad men. In fact, job training was always seen as the responsibility of the employers. They used it, they pay for it. What's happened more recently as employers have said, well, we don't want to pay for this anymore. We want the taxpayers to pay for things that we used to pay for in terms of job training. And we're, they're not going to give anything back. So, and they have, no, if, they, if they're producing, they want us to produce workers with a particular set of skills, they have no objective interest. I don't care whether they're nice people or not. There's no objective interest in having educated workers. Why pay for it? Why pay for somebody who knows how to read well, or is good in math, or could be a chemist, or that, if you want somebody to be sitting in an office and shuffling paper, which is what a lot of these white collar jobs are, if that's what you want, why do you want somebody who knows what public education is supposed to provide? And I would argue that goes from kindergarten through university level in the public sector, in the public universities. Um, so that it's, it's not true, it's not viable. Um, the cause of the skilled 
job education gap is not with the schools, and it, the schools will not get better by focusing on that. Okay, now the other thing that you mentioned was the issue of teacher compensation. How do Indiana teachers fare relative to other teachers nationally, or perhaps a, a better comparison might be in our immediate region? Well, um, it's a great question, and it's one that we've seen uh, drastic changes to over the last uh, 12 years or so. In 2008, our state legislature uh, changed the way we do funding. Uh, we used to pay for uh, public education through state income tax and sales tax, and then about 15% was paid for through property taxes. Uh, and in uh, about 2008, the state legislature basically said, we're going to do away with that property tax component uh, that helps to pay for uh, funding, and we're going to pay for it out of increased sales taxes and state income taxes that we'll generate. And then, as you know, the Great Recession of 2009 hit, and not only were they not able to do that, uh, they actually uh, reduced our state budget by about $300 million in 2009, and that money has never been replaced. Uh, so if you look at state funding nationally, Indiana ranks dead last since that time in terms of the raises we, our teachers have received from 2009 through 2020. Uh, uh, we have not kept up with the rate of inflation, so um, many teachers who've worked during all of that time would say they've actually seen a reduction in their pay because not only have we not kept up with inflation, they obviously haven't seen raises beyond that as well. So uh, we're, we're, in a, we're in a bad situation when it comes to funding. I think I saw a statistic that said 16% less compared to 2012 if you look at inflation. But the legislators point out that half of all state spending goes toward education. In the last session, the General Assembly adopted a budget that increased general education spending by 2.5 per year, um, boosted a teacher stipend program, and paid off a portion of the school's pension uh, debt to free up more dollars. And so uh, many legislators say the schools then should use those funds to pay teachers if that's something they think is important. Uh, is this feasible or? Well, I would say, you know, half the budget should, should include funding public education. I think that's the mission of the state of Indiana, should be the mission of state legislature, le le legislators. And you know, so I don't find that surprising. You know, what I do find surprising in this last budget, uh, public schools were funded at about 2%, 2.06 and maybe 2.07 for the second year of the biennium, while charter schools were funded at over 10% for each of the next two years. And 90% of our Hoosier students are in public schools. Uh, so what's happened is there's been a reduction in funding and then they've taken the pie for funding for the state of Indiana and they basically now have funded other things, such as charter schools and private schools. Uh, we have the largest expansive uh, voucher school funding program in the, in the country. So when we talk about increases in the budget, you're arguing that this doesn't make up for past cuts and that the money is not going to the traditional public schools, but now to more charter increase funding to charters and also to the choice scholarship or voucher program. Exactly. Uh, I think they're taking that funding that they are providing for education and they're, they're dividing it among more students, among more schools. Um, this is a very pro-choice state uh, and as a result of that they've, they've funded private schools um, and charter schools and I think with the loss of circuit breakers, um, uh, Superintendent McCormick just today um, put information out that we're about four million, a little over four billion dollars uh, in loss of funding to what we consider traditional public schools uh, during that time. Now, Paul, one of the things that some legislators will say is that charter schools are another form of public schools. They're publicly funded alternatives uh, and also the school choice scholarships allow parents to choose and if they are unhappy with their school, why shouldn't they as taxpayers get to do that? Um, I would like that applied to the legislature. I mean, why, why, is, are, why do we suppose that if we don't like the schools, we get to take public money and put them in private sector? I don't like our legislature. Should I not pay my taxes 
and want to go to, a, I'd, I'd rather go to the legislature in New York. They're doing more of what I'd like. They wouldn't like that, say we're not going to collect taxes from Mr. Mitchell anymore because he wants to pay taxes to New York State. But we do allow them, and this was so very regressive about it, is that people who send their kids to public, private schools and charter schools are more likely to be more advanced, advantaged than those whose parents are not doing that. So this is essentially taking tax money and giving it more to people who already have stuff than giving it to the people who need it. And that form of taxation, that kind of very, very reg regressive form of taxation is, well, I think it's, it's, it's immoral. It's a violation of the rights of, of the majority of children who attend public school. It's easier to get financial aid for going to, the, to IU Bloomington if your parents make over $50,000 a year than if your parents earn under $50,000 a year. And they'll say it explicitly that people whose parents make over $50,000 a year will be better students, right? So that the model of how funding should be used in public education from the beginning of the 20th century has been upended in the last 30 years, where instead of taking the taxation that comes from all of us and using it for the benefit of all of us, they're taking tax taxes from all of us and using it for the people who need it less. And I think that's undemocratic. And I think that uh, one of the things I would say about Red for Ed, that it's not just about teacher compensation, although teachers deserve to get paid, right? They don't, this is not a volunteer job. But I believe teachers are on the front line of defending democracy, right? <laughs> now, one of the arguments, of course, for the school choice scholarships or vouchers is that a student who does not have the means to pay for private school, but is uh, stuck, if you will, or assigned to a public school that's failing, would be able to do so using that uh, money to promote equality of opportunity. Uh, what do we know about how those dollars are being used? Well, it's true that that's, that was the, go the stated uh, goal for uh, choice. Uh, that's not proven to be what actually has happened. Uh, it's actually uh, exactly what Dr. Mishler has, has spoken to. It's, it's, it's been a way, uh, I've read articles, it's even been a way to create segregation. Uh, and what's happened is um, students who, certainly some students are benefiting from choice and, and, and charter, and I would not at all say that uh, there aren't situations in the state um, that have benefited maybe from those situations. But broadly, that's not what we've seen. We've seen uh, students leave, uh, leaving behind possibly students who are now in public schools, traditional public schools, who have greater needs and now less funding overall in that school setting, um, and it makes it even a greater challenge. Um, so I think, you know what? So most of the children taking or families taking advantage of those public dollars are actually had, had not, do not are not assigned to a failing public school or haven't attended public school and might have paid. Many themselves of them, is that I, I, one your of the last concerns. point there was a good one because many of them have never attended a public school they're they're private school families who've continued to to remain in private school um, and those those parameters for how they qualify have been broadened over time so what used to be a lower amount of maximum family income to be eligible has risen every year so now uh, students who are in a more middle class, let's say, are eligible for those choice scholarships, uh, and they've used them. And what research would also show is that public schools are still outperforming those private schools in comparison with the students who leave and the students who remain. There's a, there's a lot of research out there about that because they can, they can track that, but I believe the, the lobby for private schools uh, is so powerful um, that that's what our state has gotten behind, our state legislature has gotten behind, and as a result, um, our public schools are, are funding um, those private schools. I think there's a misconception out there that if you don't have students who, who actually leave for private school, then it's not affecting you because you're still getting the same amount of dollars per student and those students are with you. But the, re the reality of it is the state budget includes private school funding, and as that increases, Public, traditional public school funding has to be decreased. Uh, so uh, all schools, all taxpayers are paying for private school education of, of students. So even though you do have less students to educate, 
is the problem with the math there that if you had five students less in each classroom, you still have the teacher, you still have the gas, you still have the electric, so your costs doesn't go down in proportion? Exactly. You know, it's a little easier to adjust for those in larger school districts, maybe in larger urban areas, but um, you, you're seeing communities uh, who, uh, small communities who are feeling the impact of that, but you're also seeing uh, large urban areas who are feeling that impact of schools closing right here in our area. Uh, you're seeing schools impacted that with that in, in drastic ways. Uh, and that, that has an impact on the economic development of a community. Uh, and I don't think that's something that, that is considered enough. Now, Paul, this uh, demonstration mm -hmm. uh, of Red for Ag was huge. Many observers say that it was the biggest in at least 20 years. Right. To what would you attribute that, uh, the, the sort of size of the, the crowd and the number of people who wanted to show up? Well, first I think that teachers have become empowered. And I think that has to do with the sort of wave of teacher strikes in Chicago, West Virginia, LA, of, of sort of major urban areas, except for West Virginia, which was interesting in its own way, um, which had brought together, um, for the first time, teachers unions were not always clear about this. This has been a major change in the way the unions function, that see the teachers as being the main advocates for the children, not just for themselves. And that's been, a real, that's been a fight within the unions, and Karen Lewis and the people in the Chicago's Teachers Union had pioneered it. But I think parents see that the schools are the one public institution where they have actually really direct access to, right? They know the teachers, they're there every day to pick up their kids. And so as the teachers began to reach out to the community, then the sort of kind of the program of the teachers unions began to be not just we need to be paid more, but rather that we are defending our, our jobs and our, our communities. Now, some of it is I think there was a period of time where teachers in urban areas were following white flight out of the city. So they didn't live in the neighborhoods their kids lived in. And now they do again, right? So large numbers of, of teachers are living in the urban areas near their schools. Their kids are going to public schools. They see what's going on. And so they're very well positioned to say we are, as a union, are gonna take sort of the role of defending education in general. Um, I think, you know, that Indiana is nowhere near sort of the kind of mass strike um, activity that happened in Chicago and LA, but I think we should take seriously that teachers are very um, upset. I mean, I, you know, I, I was very amused by the wringing of hands when it was turned out that South Bend, South Bend had a shortage of teachers. And people are saying, God, I wonder why that is. I said. They didn't have to spend money on a study. They could take me out for coffee, and I would tell them that undercompensation, too large class, class sizes, and lack of respect. I mean, it's not that difficult to see why people who have choices, where when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, the choice to become a teacher was seen as an extraordinarily honorable profession. We had PhDs in the high school. We, our teachers lived next to doctors in the same neighborhoods. So it's not that they were getting rich. I mean, clearly teachers were never gonna get paid like doctors, but the gap wasn't so wide. And I think that what's interesting about this moment is that for teachers defending their jobs and their salaries and their, what, how their lives are is connecting to what's going on in their communities as a whole, whether it's in South Bend or Mishawaka or in the areas around here or in Chicago, LA, and West Virginia. You know, the, we are told all the time that the solution to all our problems is education. And I think finally the hypocrisy of that has come, came to the fore. Said, well, we, don't, we can't have equality because we can solve that with education. We can't deal with race because we're gonna solve it with education. Every social problem was seen as, well, the schools will solve that. And eventually, because well, if the schools are gonna solve this, you gotta start paying for it. And then it wasn't for coming, as Wayne said, is that they were, we're getting cuts. Um, no. And so that, that's the significance. And the other broad significance, I would say, is that Americans are once again waking up to the fact that the best safeguard of, of democracy and the best safeguard of an egalitarian society are trade unions. Highest proportion in 25 years of Americans who think trade unions are positive forces. Whereas the trade unions themselves are weaker than they've ever been before. Americans saying, oh yeah, I wonder if there's a connection between weaker trade unions and declining standards of living which there is. <laughs> now in 2018, 94% of the districts in Indiana reported a 
teacher shortage and one of the signs at the rally said we expect respect while another read you can't put students first if you put teachers last to what extent does it seem like teachers feel like they're being disrespected or their voices are not being heard I think teachers still feel respect in, in terms of from families and parents and within the community. Uh, I think they don't feel that same respect though on people who get to make decisions about their funding. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, they've, they've decided as, as Dr. Mishra pointed out to uh, be a part of the political action and quite honestly, it's the only way that things are probably going to change. Uh, now many districts closed after thousands of teachers requested days off to participate. Uh, how did you make that decision in your case? Well, uh, our teachers basically came to us and, and we had a large number who, who wanted to participate that day. And once we conducted a survey and found out what the need was going to be, we were not going to be able to meet that need with our, our substitute teacher pool. Uh, and it was really, quite honestly, an easy decision for us and our school board to support our teachers, to support that day for them. Uh, because as Dr. Mister pointed out so well, uh, they're not advocating just for themselves. They're advocating for what happens in the classroom, for the services that they can provide to students, for programming. It's so much more than, than teacher compensation. Our teachers uh, articulated that very well to us. Uh, and we had nearly 100 teachers uh, in Indianapolis that day. I was there with them. Our, our school board president, Mr. Dick Curry, was there with them. And, you know, I think, quite honestly, this is the only thing that's working across the country. If you look at other states, Oklahoma, Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, different states where they've seen increased funding, uh, you've seen uh, uh, some kind of political action take place there. Uh, Kentucky just had a very interesting governor election as a result of public education. So I think our teachers have to look at Red for Ed as not a one day event, but a, a movement uh, that needs to sustain itself. Now I've had a couple of legislators say to me they thought that Red for Ed might actually lead to a backlash among parents who would have to find something else to do with their kids that day. Did you get any uh, pushback on that? Certainly a concern for us was, you know, what would our, how would our students be taken care of that day? But uh, the feedback we received from parents was outstanding. They were very supportive. Uh, we had uh, parents reach out to us, communicate through our, our, our teachers, uh, and they, they understood the issues. Uh, I think there's a lot of misdirection about that they are funding us and we need to actually give that money to our teachers. Uh, and I can assure you, if we receive more funding, our, our teachers will receive that funding. Now, Governor Holcomb has created a commission to study Indiana teacher pay and look for a solution. It's expected to make recommendations to the General Assembly before the 2021 budget year. Um, do you expect some solutions to emerge? To what extent are te educators involved in this solution-seeking mission? Uh, and were you surprised the budget wasn't reopened in this non-budget year, which some people had been pushing for? Um. I, yes, I was somewhat surprised. I thought with the Red for Ed Day that they may feel some uh, pressure to open the budget, um, but they, they cited that it was the second year of a biennium budget and that they do not open the budget for those purposes, yet they did open uh, for building projects for universities and colleges throughout Indiana, I think uh, to the tune of maybe $300 million. Um, there were legislators who advocated for opening the budget for uh, public education and increase in the funding now because there is such a large surplus, but the decision was made not to do that, to allow this uh, teacher commission on teacher compensation to do their work and come back with uh, supposedly a plan that they can sustain those raises that they plan to give. But um, I can tell you teachers are skeptical. Uh, teachers are not involved uh, in the process. Uh, they were given a chances to, they had some uh, meetings across the state that teachers, educators could attend and, and, get, and provide their feedback. So it will certainly be interesting to see what, what they come up with. Well, a final word, Paul? Um, the last few seconds? Yeah, yes, I, w I would say that, I mean, as I said before, I think that, that what the teachers are doing are on the front lines of defending a democratic society that we want. Um, they're fighting for equality. They're fighting for every child that in the state and in the country. 
and they deserve all our support. Um, they love children. I mean, anybody who has a kid, in, a kid in school, whatever kind, they know teachers give so much of themselves and that they're treated so badly is, a, is like a national embarrassment. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> that will have to be the last <laughs> word for right now because we're out of time for this week. But our guests are going to stick around and you can catch the rest of our conversation online at WNIT.org slash PS. I'm your host, Elizabeth Benyon, asking you to tune in again next week and reminding you that it takes all of us to make democracy work. Thank you.